Good morning. Great to be here. So great to see everyone out as always. Couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here at the Lafayette Church of Christ. Again, if you are visiting with us, we are so very happy that you are with us. Uh, we are thrilled and we want to encourage you, don't rush off after services. Stick around. Uh, give us the opportunity to know you and uh, uh, you get the opportunity to know us to be here this morning. You know, there are a lot of verses in the Bible. You don't really have to elaborate on them. Uh, you don't really have to discuss them. You don't have to explain them, but boy, are they not powerful. And, and, and a lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, that's my favorite verse in the Bible. I cannot say that I have a very favorite verse, but the one that is before you in Isaiah chapter 40 in verse 31, it is a very meaningful passage in my life. Maybe a very meaningful passage in your life. I love how that the prophet Isaiah would write and say, Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles or like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who wait on the Lord. What I find so interesting about that phrase is that the prophet Isaiah is not the only one who has ever encouraged God's people to wait on the Lord. The psalmist made the same statement, or basically the same statement, in the book of Psalm chapter 27 in verse 14, where he would write and say, wait on the Lord. And then he would turn right around and say, he is of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So twice in that one passage of Scripture, the psalmist encourages us to wait on the Lord. So clearly, waiting on the Lord is something that God wants us to do. And it leads me to ask the question, what does it mean to wait on the Lord? What do you think it means to wait on the Lord? I remember one time I heard an individual preach a lesson on this very passage that we're going to take the time to look at this morning. It was such an intriguing lesson. The way that he explained it is the phrase wait is a word that is used much like a waiter or a waitress will go into a, you'll go into a restaurant and a waitress or a waiter will come running up to you and they are waiting to serve you. They eagerly are waiting for people to come in and sit down. And then once you come in and sit down, they come to you, they take your order, and then they turn around and they, they bring you your food. And, and they are there to serve you. And I went home and I thought, man, that was a good sermon. I'm going to take it and preach it myself. But I have never been the type to take someone else's message. And, and even if it's a faithful gospel preacher, and, and just go with it. I, I'm the world's worst to just sit down. And I'm going to study it for my own. I, I'm like the Bereans, you know, or, or those at Thessalonica. I'm not like the Bereans. I'm like those at Thessalonica who search the Scriptures to see if the things that were taught were so. And I began to study that word wait, and it, it did not mean to serve at all. In fact, not knocking, it was a good sermon. It truly was, and, and it was uh, very encouraging. But that word wait there has a different meaning. It comes from a Hebrew word which literally means to hope. Now folks, to serve someone and to have a hope is two totally different ideas. This word not only means to hope, but it means to eagerly await something. It's a lot like when I looked at that definition, it reminded me of when I was a child and my daddy used to drive a truck. He would usually leave either late Sunday afternoon or Monday morning and he wouldn't come home until Friday and sometimes it would be early Saturday morning, but he would always call before he was almost home and he would let us know that he was coming and that he would be there in a few hours and I would go to the window and, and oh, I would sit there and I would wait. And I couldn't, I just couldn't hardly wait until I saw my daddy coming up the driveway. And because I knew that he was coming home and, and I expected him to come home and I eagerly waited for him to come up that driveway. That's what this word wait here means. It carries more so the idea of being patient. Something that we greatly need in the Christian life. In fact, when you look at the, this word in the Hebrew language, and figuratively, it's spoken of as 
a cord or several small cords that you would take and you would weave them together to make a good strong rope. Now if you've ever done any weaving or if you've ever done any knitting or crocheting or anything like that, you know that that takes time and it takes patience. And that is the message that Isaiah was trying to get across to the people of Israel. In, even in the context of the Scripture, if you back up in it, what Isaiah is doing is he is prophesying that God's people are going to be taken into captivity. And then they're going to get to a point where they say, where is the Lord? Is He not able to come and to help us? You can even see that if you open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28 where God says, have you not known? Have you not heard? He asked that question already knowing the answer they knew that God was able to deliver them and here's the way that Isaiah concludes that passage you just need to be patient and therefore the message that Isaiah is trying to get across to you and me today is that we need to be people who are totally utterly and completely dependent upon God so we can patiently wait for him Throughout this line. Now there are three points that I believe that Isaiah covers in this particular text that we're going to look at. And if you don't have your Bibles already open to Isaiah chapter 40. Beginning in verse 28 and going through verse 31. I appreciate Brother Wayne reading that passage of Scripture. That's where we are going to take our study this morning. And I want us to begin by recognizing why is it that we need to wait on the Lord. And I would suggest unto you because of the fact that there's a problem that we all share. A problem that we all experience from time to time. And that's the very clear fact that life is filled with uncomfortable situations. Wouldn't you agree? Life has so many difficulties. Just think of a few of them with me, if you will. Think about the very fact of of temptation. Temptation is an uncomfortable situation, isn't it? And and we know that temptation is something that that we can't escape. It does not matter who we are. James chapter 1 and verse 14 would put it so plainly, every man is tempted. Now, by saying every man, James includes everyone. No one, it does not matter who you are, how long you've been a Christian, how spiritually strong or mature you may be, or even how much Scripture you know. Folks, I'd suggest the more you know, the more faithful you are, the harder that Satan comes after you because he wants to win you to his team. Temptation is an uncomfortable situation. And certainly sin is an uncomfortable temptation or situation. Because, you see, there are many times when we are tempted in life, we often give in to those temptations, don't we? And and, and the pains of those temptations... The Roman writer would say in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The reason that Paul would pen that letter in such a way is he wants us to know that we are humans. We're going to make mistakes. Even the Apostle John would would pen his letter in the book of 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 8 and going through verse 9, and, and he would clearly say that we are going to struggle with sin. If we say that we have not sinned in verse 10, we've made God a liar and His Word is not in us. We are going to fail. But when we do fail, oh, what an uncomfortable situation that is. You think about all of the different heartaches and all of the different pains that we experience in this life. Whatever those heartaches may be, whether it be a broken home or maybe the loss of a job or whatever it may be. Those are all uncomfortable situations. And what about sickness and and disease? It's, It's just... It just breaks my heart when I walk up and down the hospital hallways and I I look in room to room and I see so many people who are hurting. What about death? Think about how death makes you feel. 
Think about what death does to an individual and those who remain. Think about what it does to the family members. And it's something that we all know that we are going to experience someday. Hebrews 9, 27, as is appointed unto man wants to die after this, the, the judgment. Think about disaster. Just this past week, the tornadoes that ripped through our land and destroyed not just homes, but the lives, the personal belongings of so many individuals. What about persecution? It's not always easy being a Christian, is it? In fact, the Bible would teach us in the book of 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, all who live godly in Christ Jesus, well, they're going to suffer persecution. And so life is literally filled with uncomfortable situations, and that can pose a problem. And not only that, we are creatures who we grow weary. When we are met with trial after trial after trial, it's like being in a boxing arena and, and we are just being hit right and, and we're getting the left and we're getting the uppercut and, and, and when we're fighting a battle, many times it causes us to grow weary. Even Isaiah would write of that. If you'll note in, in verse 28, he would write and say, have you not honed? Have you not heard the everlasting Lord God? And then drop down, if you will, in verse 30. He would say, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. I want you to look at that passage of Scripture with me. Look there at verse 30. And note, if you will, the phrase youth and the phrase young men. Do you know what those two phrases represent? Oh, brethren, they, they represent strength. They represent endurance. They represent vitality. And, and we think about a little child. You know, often we will stand back and we will look at little children. And we'll say, boy, wouldn't you like to have his energy? A lot of people have said that to me concerning Andrew. And my immediate response is no. In this body, I'd have a heart attack if I had his energy. Uh, but you, you look at his energy and it just seems like he just goes on and on and on. And you think about young men, huh, folks, men, folks, you can think back to a time when you were much younger and you had such strength and you had such endurance. But good people even, the, the verse is very plain right there, even those youths, there comes a time when they faint and they are weary. There comes a time when that little fellow reaches the end of the day and he just conks out. And when he goes to sleep, you can stand him up and he won't even wake up. You see, he becomes weary. You think about young men and all of their strength and all of their ability. They even fall. And so the Bible is very clear that, that there's a problem that you and I experience in this life. We are met with uncomfortable situations continually. And, and when we're met with those uncomfortable situations, we tend to grow weary. And here's the main problem. When we grow weary, we often give up. Don't we? You know we do. When we are met with trial after trial after trial, we grow tired, we get weary, and we get to the point where we say, you know, it's just not worth it. And, and we don't even dare think about eagerly thinking that things are going to get better. We are literally convicted of the fact that things are only going to get better. Worse, And so, therefore, why do we need to wait on the Lord? Because, brethren, we suffer from a great problem. It's being burdened by the different difficulties in life and getting to the point where we just want to give up and quit. And so that's why we need the power. You've seen that little button before, haven't you? I've got one on my computer and every morning when I get up and I get my coffee made and I go over to my computer and I mash that little button. That little button is the power button. And what does it do? It causes my computer to come on so I can begin to use it. You as a Christian have a power button. You have a power source. And that power source is identified as God. The only problem is many times we fail to realize that He is a part of our lives and that we can turn Him on and that He will give us the power to be able to overcome any and every situation in life. All of those difficulties, all of those uncomfortable situations that we just got through talking about. 
God gives us the power to overcome them. That's why we need to wait on the Lord. What kind of power does God have? Well, Isaiah tells us. Number one, Isaiah says that his power is everlasting. I like that word everlasting. Right there in the text in verse 28, he's asking questions that he knows that they're already aware of. God was already aware of the answer. Even Isaiah was aware of the answer. God is an everlasting God. What does that word everlasting mean to you? Brethren, literally, it, it, is an, it refers to a word which goes on and on and on. And there is no end. And that's the way that God is described in the Bible. And since He is a God who is an everlasting God, He's an individual who does not have a beginning. He is an individual who does not have an end. The Bible teaches us that the strength that He offers to you and me is likewise unending. And the same writer would say in chapter 26 in verse 4, Trust in the Lord forever and Yahweh, the Lord is what? He's not just a strength. Don't you love that word? He's an everlasting strength. There'll never come a time when He will stop giving us strength as long as we serve Him. We just have to be the people who believe in the strength. The problem with this verse is people don't believe it. God is an everlasting power. And there will never come a time in my life as a Christian as I strive to serve Him where I'll call upon Him for His strength and His power and He'll say, David, I'm fresh out. That's not going to happen, folks. The Roman writer would say in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even, look at what it says, His eternal Power. He will never, ever run out of power. And that's why I need to wait on Him. That's why I need to hope in Him. That's why I need to eagerly know that whatever I experience in this life, He's going to get me through it. He is an everlasting God. But Isaiah goes on to describe Him as a Creator. Not only is He an everlasting God, Isaiah describes Him as Creator. Look at the verse again, verse 28, one we just looked at. Not only is He the everlasting God, He is the Creator. And look at, Don't you just love the way Isaiah put this? Not just the earth, but the ends of the earth. Brethren, there is a reason why He put the ends of the earth. That represents everything on the earth and everything as far as we can see and everything as far as we can come to an understanding. God is the Creator of everything we know. As the writer in Colossians would write in Colossians 1 and verse 16, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created through Him and for Him. That does not leave out anything. In fact, it includes everything. Any and everything that you and I can look at and we can gaze upon today, were it not for God, it wouldn't exist, people. He is the Creator of everything we know. Of everything beautiful, of everything majestic, He is the Creator. And you know what amazes me about it? As I go out and I gaze into the stars at night and see the beautiful moon, and I go out there and I look at the beautiful clouds, and you can't look at the sun, but you know that it's there. And He just spoke! And it came into existence. As the Hebrew writer would write in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed through the Word of God. He just spoke. And this world that we know today came into existence. Folks, that is a powerful God. But not only is He everlasting, not only is He the Creator, He's enduring. He's the most enduring being that you and I know. Look back to verse 28. Neither faints nor is weary. Neither faints nor is weary. There comes a time in every individual's life when they become faint and when they become weary. 
It doesn't matter if you eat right and you ex exercise right. And you're going to get tired. You're going to get weary. There's going to come a point when you are going to give out. You're going to have to stop. But that's not so of God, good people. I know many times when we read the Genesis account and we see that on the sixth day, uh, the, the Bible teaches us that God rested after He created man on the seventh day. He rested. But we get the idea that He had to take a break because whew, man, and he was tired. The word rested there just simply means he completed his work. Because the God we serve is not a God that needs a break, brethren. He continues on and on and on. He is an enduring individual. He doesn't feel fatigue like you and I do. He doesn't get tired like you and I get. And so he's a powerful being. In the fourth place, Isaiah described him as an unlimited God. Unlimited. Note if you will back in verse 28 again. The very last thing he said about him. His understanding is unsearchable. The word understanding there can mean a number of different things. It can refer to knowledge. It can refer to intelligence. But the idea is that his knowledge, his wisdom, his intelligence. Whatever you want to consider. There is no limit to it. No, that's hard for us to grasp. Because everything that we know in life has a limit. I can remember the Energizer Bunny commercials on TV and, and how that, that, that rabbit would just go on and on. I guarantee you folks, you go to, go to Walmart today or Family Dollar or wherever, get you some Energizer batteries, put them in a light, turn it on. There's going to come a time when that light's going to go off. Right? Because those batteries are going to wear out. Everything that you and I know comes to an end. It has a limit. But not so when it comes to God. When we read and study the Bible, we understand from this passage that He is limitless. There, there's nothing that He does not know. There is nothing that He is not capable of knowing. He knows all and He sees all and He can do all. I think about when the apostles came to Jesus and, and Jesus said to Him, you know, with man things are impossible and many things with you and I they are impossible but with God all things are what they're possible why because he is a limitless being and there is nothing too great for him and, and therefore brethren when you look back over this list why is it that we should wait on the Lord is because He is the most powerful being that we know. He is a God who is everlasting. He's our Creator. He's enduring. He is limitless in His power. And therefore, brethren, we need to come to the very clear conclusion that He is able to help you and I in whatever struggle or difficulty we may find ourselves in in life. It may be something physically. It may be something spiritually as a church. Never come to the point where we say God can't help us. That's what Israel had done. You know what a great mistake they had made in concluding that God can't help us. Because Isaiah said He can. And you know He can. And you and I may come to the conclusion where we say God can't help us, but in our mind, brethren, we know that the Bible to be true and we know He can help us. We've just got to believe it. I love the right words of the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Let your conduct or your manner of life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You see, God is able to help us, brethren. we just got to believe it. And we've got to learn to wait, to be patient, to have hope, whatever we are going through, that God is going to get us through it. Now, we talked about the problem that we all experience. We talked about the power. Isaiah is going to tell us about the promise. What, what, what is the promise? The promise is, brethren, that God will give us strength if we will just wait on Him. 
He has promised to help us. Number one, He is going to renew our strength. Look back to your text, if you will, in verse 31 this time. But those who wait on the Lord, when we recognize that there's great power in God, and we conclude, okay, I know it's going to be hard, I know it's going to be difficult, but I am going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to endure. I'm going to persevere. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. Here's what's going to happen. Number one, I'm going to renew my strength strength. Why is it that our strength needs renewed? Because when we are met with difficult circumstances in life, uncomfortable situations like we talked about, brethren, it has the ability to just drain us. You know that you get out your cell phone and if you stay on it long enough, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to look down there and it's going to say low battery. And you keep on using it, it's going to say lower battery. And <laughs> You keep on using it and it's just going to die. You gotta plug it up. Brethren, do we not find ourselves spiritually like that in life? We just get drained because we're being used so much. And our strength needs to be renewed. And the Bible teaches us when we wait patiently. Now that does not mean we sit by idly. We have to do the Lord's work. We've got to continue on and be faithful to the Lord. But when we are faithful to Him, we wait on Him. We're, we're enduring then He's going to renew our strength. It's, it's a lot like in Job chapter 14 and verse 7. In Job 14 verse 7, the Bible says, For there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease. You ever been going through the woods and seen this? Oh, I have many times. I've seen where, where, where loggers will come in and they will cut down a tree. And I will stand back and say, man, that was such a beautiful tree. And, and, and then go back maybe a year or so later and you, you've got those little sprigs coming right up out of the stump. Why is that? Because the roots are deep. And brethren, there are many times in life when we will be cut down literally by the difficult things that we experience. But when our roots are deep in the Lord Jesus Christ and we're waiting on Him, we will just do just like Job said, we'll sprout again. Just like all those plants do. This congregation, brethren, has the ability to sprout again, again, and again. But we've got to wait patiently on the Lord. We've got to do our work and know that He is the one who is going to give the increase. He's going to help us. We've got to believe that. But not only is the promise of a renewed strength, there's the promise of the wings of eagles. I like that statement. Back in verse 31 again. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. What do you think the significance is of that statement? When you think about a, a, an eagle's wings, it's just, it's just something fascinating to study. A, a full-grown eagle, his wingspan is going to be about eight feet. Now, folks, that's further than what I can reach out. Do you know, have you ever stopped to think about the fact that, that when you see an eagle, very seldom is he going through the air flapping his wings. He will flap his wings to a particular point, but there comes a point where all he's going to do is what? He's just going to soar. Do you realize that an eagle's wings are so heavy that if he spends a lot of his time flapping his wings, he will literally tire and die from exhaustion. You see, an eagle must learn to soar above the earth. What's Isaiah trying to teach you and me? He's teaching us that we are going to be faced with difficulties in life. And they are going to weigh us down. And if we keep flapping our wings, we're going to fall just like we do many times. We're going to give up. We're going to quit. So what do we got to do? We've got to learn to soar. We've got to learn to recognize that we can soar. And we can soar above any and every problem that we face in this life. How in the world can we do that, David? Because you've got the power. We've already talked about that, brethren. We've got the power of God. The Bible teaches us clearly in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Now unto Him, that's God, who is able to do what? Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now you look at the next part, brethren. What does it say? According to the power that works in us. We don't believe that passage. 
Because brethren, if we did, we would understand every problem that we face in this life. God's power. That, that power, you remember we talked about a moment ago? That unlimited power, that enduring power, that, that power just keeps going on and on. That power is in you and me. But brethren, the condition is we've got to wait on the Lord. We've got to be patient. We've got to endure. We've got a hope. And we, like the Apostle Paul, can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What did Paul mean by that? You know exactly what he meant. There's no problem he couldn't soar above. And therefore, brethren, the same message is for you and me. There is no problem that we can't soar above when we patiently wait on the Lord trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not to your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 you see we've got to trust in God and we trust in God and we continue to live and, and, and do His will then brethren He is going to carry us through note if you will also in the third place of the promise there's a lack of weariness A lack of weariness. Go back to the text there. They shall run and not be weary. Being a runner, it's hard for me to understand that passage. Because I get tired. I get weary. Some mornings I will leave the driveway and before I get 500 feet from the house, that little voice is in my head saying, you are ignorant. Go back home. It's warm. You don't need to do this. And then after I have run a a good distance, then my body will begin to tire. My breath begins to give out. My, My legs begin to ache. I get weary. But the Bible says that when we wait on the Lord, we totally and completely depend on Him. And brethren, we will not only run, not just walk, we're going to run and we won't be weary. That teaches us that nothing we meet in this life can keep us from living for the Lord. And then in the fourth place, another promise is that we will not faint. We will not faint. We will not come to the conclusion in our life where we are going to give up and quit. You remember the problem? The problem is because of the fact that we are met with uncomfortable situations and we get tired and we get weary, then we naturally have the tendency to give up and quit. Isaiah says that when we wait on the Lord, we will walk and we will not faint. We won't ever get to the point that we say, we've had it, we're done for. An individual who comes to the conclusion and say, I give up and quit, is an individual who is not waiting on the Lord. And so brethren, we need to be people who we need to wait on the Lord. And I think this is a great message for all of us. It does not matter if you are an individual who is living a faithful Christian life. You need to wait on the Lord. Keep on waiting. It does not matter if it's referring to our church and we want to see it grow. We want to see the contribution grow. We've got to wait on the Lord. Whatever it may be, we've just got to learn to wait on the Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a child of God. You need to become one. Wait on the Lord. Be patient. Don't stand there when that invitation song is sang and Brother J.L. leads us in it and then hold on to that pew. You let go. And you come and you trust the Lord and you be obedient to His will. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of sins. And you leave here this morning a child of the living God waiting on the Lord in the life that you live. Maybe you're here and you're already a child of God and your life is not right. Maybe there are some things that are wrong. Maybe you just haven't been waiting on the Lord. Maybe you're going through a struggle that you you need to get through and you need to overcome. Here's the solution. Wait on the Lord. Maybe you need the prayers of the brethren. You know, when you think about the invitation, it's not necessarily that you have to come forward because you're guilty of sin and there's something wrong. Maybe you just need prayers and encouragement. Brethren, that's what we're here for. We are a family. And whatever your need may be, won't you come as we stand? That's what we're saying.